The chapter that uh, we're looking at here in number 16 is incredibly dramatic, isn't it? And um, yeah, we, we, we haven't read through the whole chapter, although we do want to sort of take points from uh, right through the chapter, really. So I'm, I'm kind of assuming that, that that you'll just by reading those first few verses, you'll have got it back in your mind and you can remember these events of what's gone on here. And it seems very clear that the problem arises because self-interest became more important to these people, Cora, Dayton and company, uh, than putting God first. Uh, just look back to the end of chapter 15 and see the advice that was given and yet clearly not heeded. So it says in Exodus, Numbers 15, apologies, in verse 37, Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Yahweh and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am Yahweh your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Yahweh your God. Uh, and the emphasis in verse 39 is that they must not do things for self. God needed to be at the center of their lives. It was pressed upon them that they should remember that. They had to remember the word of God and do it. And it's particularly sad that Korah led this rebellion when we consider his role. And, and Moses, I think, singles him out for this reason. He, he says to Korah in verse 8, uh, so number 16 in verse 8, Moses said unto Korah, here I beseech you, you sons of Levi, seemeth it a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of Yahweh, to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also? Now, of course, we know Psalm 106 tells us in verse 16 that they were moved with envy. They, they, they couldn't deal with the fact that Moses had this role. Uh, they couldn't accept and be satisfied and content with their lot and what God wanted them to do. But, but really, we, we realise, again, just you know, emphasise how sad it is that they were doing this when they were sons of Levi. Now, I'm going to share my screen here and just um, share with you the, this, this particular slide just now that hopefully you can just see you know, how that Korah, he was one of the sons of Kohath. Now, I'd like us to go back to Numbers chapter three, please. So if we just turn to Numbers three, we'll, we'll see what exactly the, the role of the sons of Kohath uh, what therefore Korah's role was in the tabernacle. So let's see if we can find this. So let's read Numbers 3 and verse 29. The families of the sons of Kohath shall pitch on the side of the tabernacle southward, and the chief of the house of the fathers of the families of the Kohathites shall be Elizaphan, the son of a zeal. So we, we know who Korah's uh, father and grandfather is, and we also now know where they were in relation to the tabernacle. They were on the, the south side. And their role was to look after the things within the tabernacle. So just keep reading in verse 31. Their charge shall be the ark and the table, and the candlestick, and the altars, and the vessels of the sanctuary were within they minister, and the hanging, all the service thereof. So they've got this job to look after the things in the holy place and the most holy place. Now, when we think about what those things represent in the tabernacle, the lampstand being the word, the table of showbread being fellowship, um, and I could Phil can make a, a good case for that with some other references on the ones I put up there in, in terms of Acts 2. And then the altar of incense, most certainly representing prayer. 
Psalm 141, may my prayer be before thee as incense. So the very things that they were there to look after, they had forgotten about, hadn't they? They'd lost what those things represented. And, and it seems that these men had let those things just become ritualistic things, which they weren't giving any thought to. And of course, for all of us, there's a lesson there, isn't it? That if we allow any of those things in our lives, like the, the readings, for example, going to the meeting, uh, saying prayers at mealtime, to just simply be something that all it is is a ritual, then we could easily end up in problems as they did. And, and what that I think we can learn from this is that it, that begins when, it, when it's going to go really wrong, when our priorities change from keeping God at the centre of our lives to wanting a, a bit of importance and, and, and recognition of ourselves and, and perhaps wider than ourselves in terms of thinking, in terms of like, let's recognise mankind and, and celebrate mankind and all his, his uh, brains and wonder uh, instead of keeping God at the center so instead of remembering the word of god which they were commanded to do in those final verses of chapter 15 they forgot now keep a marker in number 16 really we can leave that there but we'll perhaps come to number 16 but i also want it to come to psalm 106 that psalm that i've already referred to which tells us that they were moved with envy so psalm 106 And yes, yeah, verse 16 that tells us they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron, the saints of Yahweh. And the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. So, so you can see, you know, this is just such you know, uh, a clear record of this time. Keeping on going, verse 18, a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. So, so very clearly, this is a reference, isn't it, to the events of number 16. Now, I'd like us to, um, you know, return to numbers, but, but I'm sure that just before we do, just notice that it's only Dathan and Abiram mentioned in the psalm. Okay, so we'll just keep that in mind and we'll give a possible suggestion as to why that might be the case uh, in, in the class in due course. But back in Numbers, we've seen clearly that they forgot the commandment of God, that they lost its significance in their lives. And we can now see where the element of fellowship went wrong. So you know, I think it's kind of really interesting that those very things, the lampstand, the word of God, they've forgotten that. OK, we're now seeing I'm going to show you that fellowship went wrong in their lives. So. Come back to number 16 and let me see if I can show you that as clearly as I can. Now, do you remember we saw from numbers three, and I pointed out to you that they camped on the south side of the tabernacle, the Kohathite. So I've highlighted it here in yellow. So you've got my special diagram made of just uh, rectangles um, and circles of the tabernacle. Um, and we see where the Kohathites, so this is, of course, where uh, Korah and Co are from, so where they were. And what I want you to notice is in number 16 and verse 1, you've got Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and Onan, uh, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. Now, look now where the Reubenites were, and you recognise, don't you, that the Reubenites would have had to kind of walk through the camp of the Kohathites to get to the tabernacle. And it seems very clearly then that their fellowship went wrong. That part of the tabernacle that they should have been looking after, the showbread, which represented fellowship, that went wrong in their lives too. And we're seeing how fellowship, rather than being a positive thing to help one another to the promised land, as it should be, became a means of challenging and 
uh, Moses and, and channeling murmurings. And what a warning that is for us to heed, isn't it? That the brother or sister who we are close to, or the one who perhaps we kind of reach out to, we can be a big influence on. And the key to question that we've got to answer ourselves, isn't it, is how do I, how do I, John Owen, influence my brothers and sisters for, for positive or for negative? Uh, and all of us have got to, to answer that personally, haven't we? How am I influencing my, the brothers and sisters around me? Am I helping them to get to the kingdom or in my murmurings actually dragging people down? And it can be very easy to murmur, can't it? To speak negatively of people, to, uh, to just grumble about the, the situation, to, to grumble perhaps about the ABs at the meeting and, and how are they going to sort out uh, this COVID situation? How are we going to... Now, I have no idea about your situation at all, um, but, but I just know human nature. And I, and I know that we're, really we're all the same and all of us have got to continually challenge ourselves, haven't we, to think, how am I influencing my brothers and sisters, am I using fellowship to support them for good? So we've seen then that they forgot the commandment of God from Numbers 15. So the word of God went out of their minds, the lampstand. Fellowship was messed up with them, the showbread. And now I'm going to show you that they also allowed their prayers to become an abomination. Now, remember that within the tabernacle, incense is a symbol of prayer, Psalm 141, verse 2. And censers were used to offer incense. And Moses says to them in verse 5, so number 16 I am, and verse 5, even tomorrow Yahweh will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even to him whom he had chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do Take you censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before Yahweh tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom Yahweh doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. So that there seems no doubt in my mind that Moses is bringing their minds back to Leviticus 9 and 10. Now let's just go there quickly. So uh, just flip back to Leviticus. Um, and in particular, we're going to go into Leviticus 10. But this was the incident where Aaron's sons, so Moses' nephews, Nadab and Abihu, offer strange fire before God. Now, I'm just going to give you a cross reference here on the screen. So you're in Leviticus 10 and perhaps got a finger in number 16 as well, which is great. But let me give you this cross reference as well. When the law regarding incense was given, the Lord God said, you shall offer no strange incense thereon. Okay, that's in Exodus 30 and verse 9. And that word strange, I've put there as a little note for you, is to do with adultery. In other words, don't ever offer incense to anybody else. And that's highlighted again in verse 27. As for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto the holy for Yahweh. Now, of course, Nadab and Abihu ignored this. And so we read in Leviticus 10 and verse 1 that this Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before Yahweh. Now, the cross reference to have in our margin there is Exodus 30 and verse 9, isn't it? This strange fire it was adulterous. It wasn't for God, which he commanded them not, it says. And they went out fire from Yahweh and devoured them. And they died before Yahweh. So in Korah, Dathan and Abiram's case, their incense, rather than being to God a sweet smelling savour, was clearly strange. It was for someone else. And can I suggest who it was for? 
Well, my suggestion back in Numbers 16, or perhaps just look at the end of Numbers 15, is really that it was for themselves. A bit like that Pharisee who prayed thus with himself, too self-centered, too interested in themselves as opposed to looking to forward the purpose of God. And so the very things that Korah was meant to look after were now lost on all of them. They'd neglected to remember the word, despite the fact that they were there looking after the lampstand. They'd abused the privilege of fellowship, despite the fact that they went each Sabbath and shared the fellowship meal on the table of showbread. And they had lost what prayer was about. Their prayers, instead of being sweet to God, were strange to God. And in a way, it strikes me that they were a bit like Adam and Eve in Eden. Uh, and perhaps my mind goes there because, as I showed on the screen there, the tabernacle was a cameo of Eden. God walked amongst them. And the first reference I've given you each time is regarding the tabernacle and the second reference relation to Eden. The entrance to the tabernacle was on the east side, wasn't it? Just as it was in, in Eden. And just like the uh, in Eden, the, the cherubim were put there at the entrance. So, too, on the gates the, of the, the tabernacle, uh, say so the gates, you know what I mean? The, the curtains that was the gateway, there was the cherubim stitched on. The, the priests were to dress and to serve in the tabernacle, and they're the same Hebrew words we get regarding Adam and the commandment God gave him in Eden. And, of course, we also get the tree of life within. Now, in, which we'll see at the end of the tree, the sort of tree of life I'm referring to there in Hebrews 9 and verse 4 was Aaron's rod that budded, you know, right in the center of the tabernacle in the most holy place within the ark was this rod that budded, you know, it's the tree of life, isn't it, that, um, but actually, it's as a result of this incident that the, the Aaron's rod that budded was put into the, the most holy place. But it, however you look at it, you can see the tree of life, I think, within the um, tabernacle. You know, if you're just looking at the lampstand, for example, you know, it's all to do with really a tree. You know, it's an almond tree in that case, isn't it? So like, really, we do see the tabernacle as a, a little cameo of Eden. And where Korah and company should have been serving in the tabernacle, instead, they rebelled. And like Adam and Eve, they took. Now, why do I say that? Look at number 16 and verse one. The, it speaks about these lists, these men. And then it simply says at the end, took. And you'll see that the word men is in italics. So in other words, it's not there. The point is they took. And that is what happened in Eden, isn't it? Uh, if you went to Genesis 3, <coughs> sorry, you see clearly how that, of course, they looked for something that they wanted and they took. And we're also reminded of Genesis again, it seems to me, in verse 2. And my margin picks this up for me. Um, the end of verse two says they were men of renown. Now, that, of course, reminds us of Genesis six and verse four. Where in the time of Noah, at a time when God was looking to undo his creation and flood the earth because of the wickedness of the men of renown. Genesis six and verse four. And the Hebrew for renown is sem is the word for name. And essentially, it's telling us that these were self-centered individuals looking to make a name for themselves rather than glorify God's name. Now, notice, too, another connection I think we can see to Eden, that the, the way in which we see how that they actually, um, yeah, cite scripture, but but actually leave out part of scripture. And, and that's really what Eve did in Eden. So, so let me show you this. So look at verse three of number 16. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy and every one of them 
and Yahweh is among them. Now, if you look in your margin, mine it does anyway, picks up Exodus 19 and verse 6. So let's hold number 16 and go back to Exodus 19 and see how that Korah is citing scripture here. He, he, he's, God did say that in Exodus 19. But what I'm going to show you here is that this is really what Eve did in Eden. Why do I say that? Well, have a look at Exodus 19 and let's just pick up the smallest bit of context from verse five. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall you be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So, yes, it's true that God had said they would be a holy nation, but they have very clearly, purposefully left out verse five, as it were. They've left out the part about keeping God's word, the bit about being obedient. They were willfully ignorant of the commandment that was given to them. Now, of course, going back to number 16, the, the warning for us is that too easily we can be led by our human nature, picking and choosing scriptures with, to, 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 and using them as it suits us best at that particular circumstance in our life. Or if we want to kind of justify our relations doing something which we kind of think, oh, no, or, or perhaps we, we could justify that from scripture. And of course, I'm not saying that we can't and they change our views on, on the scriptures. That, that's a good thing, isn't it? If, if we think we, we realize actually perhaps I've got something a bit wrong here and I need to make amendments, of course we should be doing that all the time. But actually what we don't want to be doing is watering down the word and ignoring parts of it because it's not convenient for us or the society in which we live. We've got to make sure we take the whole counsel of God. I should have told you before going back to number 16, but it's not very far away to just stop off at numbers 14. Let's just go there for a moment to see how the seeds of the rebellion very likely started earlier. So numbers 14. And we'll pick up in verse one. All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we died in the land of Egypt, would God we died in this wilderness and wherefore hath Yahweh brought us into this land to, to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it out is an exceeding good land. If Yahweh delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. So we notice, don't we, how the murmurings are there and they want to set up a captain. Now, a good cross reference here is from Nehemiah 9 and verse 16 and 17, which I put on the screen, which tells you that they did actually set up a captain. And of course, the suggestion is that that was Korah. Now, whilst we don't know that for that as an absolute fact, we do know that they did set up a captain, but we don't know for sure who it was. What we do know for sure is that the words which are used here by Moses, Joshua, Caleb, Aaron, which is saying, look, in verse eight, if you are delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which flows with milk and honey. Those very words are used back in, in absolute you know, blasphemous ways to Moses to just go back to number 16 and, and perhaps you notice this when we were reading it but compare number 16 and verse 12 Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram the sons of Eliab and said we will not come up uh, sorry and they said we will not come up 
Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that flows with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Accept thou thyself altogether a prince and make thyself altogether a prince over us. Now, that's just unbelievably rude, isn't it? It's blasphemous that they are referring to Egypt as the land that flows with milk and honey, where they said, look, this land, you know, the spies, uh, Joshua, Caleb said, you know, look, this land flows with milk and honey. God is willing to give it to us. They are now saying, oh, no, Egypt was the land that that flowed with milk and honey. You know, and you're you're looking to make yourself a prince over us and, and lead us around this wilderness. It's incredible that they would do that and turn again the word of God against Moses. And of course, Moses, the meekest man, we know full well he didn't want to be a prince over them at all. It, you know, he was scared stiff of that role, but God made sure that he did it in his strength. Well. One of the ways that it seems that Korah really didn't necessarily physically lead them back to Egypt, but what he did do was pull them into Egypt spiritually. And here in this chapter, we notice that Korah set up a rival um, fellowship and tried to create his own worship. We'll have a look at verse 24. So we're going beyond our reading now, but verse 24, Moses is told, speak unto the congregation saying, get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. And again, verse 27, they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side. So can you see, it seems very clear, doesn't it, that actually they'd set up their own tabernacle, so divisive. And again, that can happen. Um, And uh, sadly say that we've seen it a little bit in um, the UK. Um, I know of Anaclesia, at least, where during this problem with COVID, one ecclesia has almost split where you know, essentially some people with large personalities who want to start going against the word of God in some instances are looking to set up their own worship now, their own Zoom that they go to and left the rest of the ecclesia struggling. It's so wrong to do something like this. How can you study the word of God and ever think that that would be an appropriate thing to do? Well, God was so angry with what went on here that he dealt with this incident in an extraordinary way. We're going to come to that, but I'd like you to, again, put a marker or something in in number 16 and come with me to another psalm, Psalm 73, please. Now, Psalm 73. Asaph, the inspired psalmist, a Levite, is contemplating how the wicked seem to prevail, how sin seems to keep on going. He says, I I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then he says in verse 11, they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I've cleansed my hands in vain and washed my hands in innocency. And what he's saying is, look, I I tried to do the right thing, but I'm getting nowhere, it feels to me. And and these people, that they're they're doing brilliantly in life. And yet, what lovely is this? That within the sanctuary court was a clear picture that sin would be dealt with ultimately by God. Verse 17. Well, verse 16 for context. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. I'm struggling with life and, you know, these people are all doing doing fine. Until, verse 17, what a key word, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? 
They are utterly consumed with terrors. Note your marginal reference against in a moment there in verse 19. And my marginal reference has number 16 and verse 21. God destroyed them in a moment. And so the psalmist, what he's saying is, when I went into the sanctuary, I recognised there's something there that's going to help them to see this, that actually, in the end, people that push for their own ways, they will be brought down, and it will happen in a moment. And so the psalmist learns the lesson not to trust in self, but rather in God. And he says in verse 25, whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord Yahweh, that I may declare all thy works. I'd like to notice again that in verse 27, the phrase, thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee, is taken from Numbers 15 and verse 39, where we started, when God said, you will do that if you don't follow my commandments. Now, the censors of Cora and company, we know that they were used for a particular reason. Now, just um, perhaps hold Psalm 73, because you might just want to make a note there. But come back to where we left our markers in number 16. And I'd like you to see what happens to the censors of Cora and Co. So in number 16 and verse 38, we read, The censors of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar. For they offer them before Yahweh, therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. So in other words, in the tabernacle that then became the temple, these censers that were taken, so imagine these censers could hold coals, but instead they were made broad, they were hit with a hammer, bang, bang, and hammered onto the side of the altar where the sacrifices would be. So you can see then why in Psalm 73 I'm suggesting that when the psalmist went into the sanctuary and understood their latter end, that he was visually hit by seeing the, the altar and seeing these censers hammered onto the side of the altar and confident, of course, yes, God will not allow sinners to go on forever. God will bring them down. And in this case, as we see with uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, it happened in a moment. Now, interestingly, in Numbers, the word for sign, and I'll put this on the screen for you now, is a, a different Hebrew word to the, to the normal Hebrew word. Okay, now, so it's quite interesting. The normal Hebrew word for sign um, is, is their apologies. But in Numbers 26, we see this different word that's used, but once again translated as sign. But the one in Numbers 26, and just let's just go there so we just see this. Numbers 26 and verse 10. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah, and then when that company died, what time the fire devoured 250 men, and they became a sign. 
Now, this particular word for sign is really quite a special word. It's the word used in Numbers 21 regarding the, the ensign, or the, the sign that was set up when the, the serpent was set up on a rod in the wilderness. So, yes, there was this clear sign there that God had dealt with those sinners. But, but we've got to look for a deeper meaning here, haven't we? So, yes, we see that the word in verse 38 is just the normal word for sign in, in number 16. But we're being told there's a deeper significance to this whole thing. We've been told that from Numbers 26 and verse 10, where a different Hebrew word is being used, this time the word nace. And again, I've given you another cross reference there to Isaiah 11, uh, the ensign that set up. But it strikes me that the one, the, the, the reference Numbers 21 in relation to the serpent is absolutely crucial here. Because, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ makes the point, doesn't he, in John 3, that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the sign, so the Son of Man had to be lifted up, that anyone who believes in him could be saved. And so what he's seeing here, isn't he, the psalmist, when he goes to there, is recognising that God would deal with sin. And, and we've got to, when we go on a Sunday and we have that memorial meeting and we see there the sign of the bread and the wine, we're remembering, aren't we, that God, he's dealt with sin in the Lord Jesus Christ, but he hates sin. We realise how awful it is. And we, we, we look to make changes in our life to make sure that we are dealing with that. And that's what we see in the case of the psalmist, don't we? And then having been to the sanctuary, the psalm then shows how he then of course, I'm going to put my trust in God. And so we look to try to do, replicate that in a sense. Now, so let's just follow a few more verbal links here that I think are interesting. The language, back, so back in number 16 again, and I want to make sure that you see how that it is described as they go in a moment. So that is in verse 21. Yahweh spoke to Moses and unto Aaron saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And that we noticed, didn't we, was picked up in Psalm 73. So here we go on our screen now. We can see number 16 and Psalm 73. But I think that this is also thrilling because that language is also used in 1 Corinthians 15 regarding the fact that because of the Lord Jesus Christ's victory over sin in his death and resurrection, we shall be changed in a moment. And that verse then goes on to say that death is swallowed up in victory. It's amazing, isn't it, to see that death is swallowed up in victory. So just as they were swallowed up and uh, just to give you the cross reference for that, number 16 and verse 32 the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. So surely there's a great cross reference to put then to, to 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 54, that, that ultimately death will be swallowed up in victory. God will deal with sin and deal with sin's consequence in, de in death. God is going to deal with these things. And he put a reminder of that in the tabernacle, in the temple, banged onto the side of that altar. And we have a reminder of that. If we see the significance of what the Lord Jesus Christ did, and we remember that when we go and break bread and drink wine. I also think, brothers and sisters, that we should notice here that the idea of being swallowed up, the earth swallowing them up, is a connection back to Exodus 15, which again I've put on the screen, the song of Moses, when they came out of Egypt, and you know what happened to those Egyptians, the Lord God opened the, the sea, opened the earth under the sea, and swallowed them up, that's what it says in Exodus 15 and verse 12, and it reinforces, doesn't it? that their heart, Korah and Co, their heart was in Egypt. They'd lost sight of the goal and wanted to simply serve self. And as a result, they died like the Egyptians. Brothers and sisters, I hope we recognise what a blessing we have if we stick with our leader, 
the one God has appointed. May we be careful not to become associated with those who, whose trust comes away from God and the Lord Jesus and, and more about what they personally can achieve or, or start to trust in the wisdom of man. Come forward to Jude. So we're going to go right to the end of uh, our Bibles to Jude's letter. And here Jude, writing towards the end of the first century, is having to exhort brothers and sisters to contend earnestly for the faith. Why? Well, because verse 4, Jude and verse 4, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They were denying the Lord Jesus, just as Cor and Co had tried to usurp the authority of Moses. It says in verse 8 that they were despising dominion, Jude and verse 8. They were despising dominion. And so he writes in verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, run greedily after the error of Balaam for a ward, and perished in the gainsayings of Korah. We see how they followed the strife of Korah. In verse 16, we notice these are murmurers, complainers walking after their own lusts and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. So we see verse 19, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. We see then how he surely still has these associates of Korah in mind when he writes in verse 20, but ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And so we see there, don't we, that the antidote is back in verse 20, to build up the faith. Faith comes from what the word, doesn't it? Yeah, Romans 10 verse 17. To pray in the spirit of holiness and to look after one another. A helpful fellowship is to pull out of the fire. It's not to get people close to the fire and let them fall into it because we're, we're, we're too scared to, to pull them up on anything. We should be pulling people out of the fire, shouldn't we? Looking to help. And of course, at times, looking with some to have compassion, making a difference, seeing where that can help with brothers and sisters, trying to get that balance right of, of showing compassion where we, we should do in circumstances uh, and other times put, saving them with fear, pulling them out of that fire. And it's clear what a warning the events of that rebellion needs to be for us all. They're being picked up by the spirit to help us see the dangers of not contending for the faith. Now, interesting, although we won't look at it now, the very last rebellion at the end of the millennium period in, in Revelation 20 is dealt with by fire coming down from heaven. You know, in the end, that's how dramatic this was. We also think that we could go to 2 Timothy uh, 2, to 2 Peter 2 where they also comment on this situation. But, but we'd like to go back now and consider the positive lesson, which we feel we can draw from this situation. And we'll try to do that as a, as a conclusion. You see, despite the terribleness of what happened in this rebellion in number 16, there is a group of people whose faithfulness becomes known 
to all generations because of what they did at this time. They stepped away from this rebellion. And of course, you remember that this group was Korah's own sons. So we notice this back in number 16 and verse 27. They got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents with their wives and their sons and their little children. And so we notice, don't we, that actually Korah and Co, Korah was on his own. His children are not there in the same way that Dathan and Abiram's were there. And we recall the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit, inherit everlasting life. Korah's sons must have stepped away from this rebellion. And it suggested that perhaps that's the reason that Psalm 106 just mentions Dathan and Abiram, almost out of respect for those sons of Korah. Now, if you come to 1 Chronicles 9, you can leave number 16 now. Come with me to 1 Chronicles 9. We'll see that Korah's sons become gatekeepers in the tabernacle service. So 1 Chronicles chapter 9. And we're going in at verse 19. Shalom, the son of Kor, the son of um, Abi Asaph, the son of Korah, and his brethren of the house of his father, the Korahites, were over the work of the service, keepers of the gates of the tabernacle, and their fathers, being over the host of Yahweh, were keepers of the entry. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, was the ruler over them in time past, and Yahweh was with him. Now, there's a couple of things that are lovely here, aren't there? One, of course, that they now have this role within the tabernacle service again. But isn't it lovely that Phinehas, this wonderfully faithful priest, was put over them? Th these sons who were left fatherless were provided by, or God provided for them, and put Phinehas over them. And no doubt his faithfulness affected them because they became known as faithful men. I'd like to turn to Psalm 42 now. We're drawing to a conclusion, but come to Psalm 42. This is the first of a number of psalms that are um, some psalms of the sons of Korah. I think there's perhaps 11 or 12 psalms, the reason I've put 43 in um, sort of a question mark is because essentially Psalm 43 it really goes with Psalm 42. So really we sort of um, happily put those two in together. What I'd like to see though now is if we scan through some of these psalms, we'll see some great lessons have been learned. So Psalm 42, verse 1, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. And can you see now that their, their priority is God? That's what they want more than anything else. Verse 4, when I remember thee, I pour out my soul in me. For I've gone out, gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Can you see now how their fellowship is with the multitude to go to the house of God? That's what they want now. It's not as it was before where their fellowship became something that corroded and dragged people down. Now it's to go with the voice of joy to the house of God. Verse 6. Oh, my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill of Mizar? And it, what I love about this now is that 
you know, they were told in Numbers 15 at the end, remember God. And now they're saying, I'll remember you wherever I am. It doesn't matter where I am, the land of Jordan, the, the Hermonites, the Hillamites, wherever I am, I'm going to remember you. Verse eight, yet Yahweh will command his love and kindness in the daytime. And in the night, his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. And so now their prayer is only for God. It's not strange in sense. This is for God only. And then verse nine, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And I, I think really it's a rhetorical question. It's more likely God who forget them in a sense they're saying in this psalm, rather than them forgetting God. They will never forget God. That's what they're saying, isn't it? And then in Psalm 43, and verse three, oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. That's where I want to be. They want the light of the truth now to lead them. And it's lovely that you can keep doing this. It's such a nice thing. I, re I recommend anyone to just enjoy doing this. Go through these Psalms, thinking about those sons of Korah. But I'd like to go just to Psalm 84. So Psalm 84 and this kind of second set where we uh, see these Psalms for these sons of Korah. See what they say here. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Yahweh of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Yahweh. My heart and my flesh crieth unto the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Yahweh of hosts, my king and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. Selah, value that. That's what Selah means. Value that. Verse 6. Now, these people who want to be in God's tabernacles, they don't want to associate with anybody else. We notice also in verse six, they can turn a disaster into learning. Passing through the valley of weeping, Baaka, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. And it was actually the word pools is the idea of blessings. It's lovely, isn't it? So in other words, these people have learned to turn a disaster situation. Their, their, their father was swallowed up in the, before their eyes because of his wickedness. But they've turned the valley of Baaka into something of blessing. We notice in verse eight, their prayer is for God. O Yahweh of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. We notice in verse 10, they won't fellowship with wicked people. That's not what they're after. A day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And then finally, in Psalm 85 and verse eight, I will hear what God Yahweh will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Now they want to just listen to God. Well, the last lesson that I think we can just take, which will take us one minute, is perhaps from number 17. And don't worry about turning there. But you remember, we've been in number 16. And in number 17, to ensure that lessons were learned from this rebellion, God gives a sign to show his choice of high priest. And you remember how the sign was that Aaron's rod budded. It came to life. Number 17 and verse 8, don't worry about turning there. But we know, of course, that in our lives, God has chosen the Lord Jesus Christ. And the resurrection, you know, the, the rod that budded, the resurrection put that beyond all doubt. And so we read in Acts 17, God hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Wrath, he has given assurance unto all men. Just like that assurance with the rod that budded for us, the assurance is that he's raised Jesus from the dead. And so let us sincerely keep the lamp burning. Ensure we don't neglect the reading of his word and actually take it on, not like Korah. May our prayers be a sweet incense to God. Make sure that, that we are praying to God. It's not strange fire. We're listening to God and then we're turning and praying to God. And may we use the privilege of fellowship 
to build each other up, always keeping God at the centre of our lives.